Just stay hungry, stay foolish. Ian McGilchrist has agreed to come back to do a part three of The Matter of Things, this time on intuition and perception. Before we launch into that part three, I want to thank our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. Let's get into this part three of The Matter of Things. We live in two worlds, the world of sight and the world of thought, wrote Friedrich Max Müller, one of the most celebrated philologists of the 19th century. And strange as it may sound, nothing that we think, nothing that we name, nothing that we find in our dictionary can ever be seen or heard or perceived. Perception is not the same as attention and not at all the same as thinking. Welcome back <laughs> for part three he who grasps two massive books in both hands, <laughs> Ian McGilchrist. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back, uh, sir. Thanks very much, uh, Aidan. That's great. <laughs> it's great to have you back. I, 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 I didn't tell you this. I sent you a pin, but I, m one of my practices for the show to get me into the right headspace is to wear a pin that tries to reflect it. And I found a pin, get a load of this, that has like two little eyes sticking out of a brain. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, perfect for perception. Perfect. So, uh, well, you very kindly sent me some lapel badges, but I haven't really got a suitable jacket to wear them on. So I'm, <laughs> there, there they are. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, let's launch into perception because it, it many, many of us would think it's the same as attention, but it's something far different, as I alluded to in that brief introduction. Yes. Uh, for one thing, you can attend in, in a number of modalities. Um, it's nothing, attention isn't confined to vision, for example. And, and so when we attend, we can attend with different uh, faculties, but we can also perceive with different faculties. And it's not necessarily the case that we are, we are attending when we're perceiving or we're perceiving when we're attending. So, uh, what 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 is all this in in simpler terms? Um, I'm talking in terms of perception of the ways in which we normally think that we get data about the world. So we we see it, we hear it, we we touch it, we may smell it, we may even taste it. Um, we have these senses which guide us a certain amount to the nature of reality, and they can be mistaken at times. But generally speaking, they're pretty good at um, orientating themselves to the context. So much are they good at orientating themselves to the context that they, they can give rise to um, a, a visual illusion, which is quite extraordinary. I, I include it in the beginning of the, the, the intuition chapters. It's the one with the cylinder and the checkboard. And, and it doesn't matter how hard you look at this, <laughs> you, you think the, the, those things, those colors are completely different. Just to say that your perceptions and um, all your faculties can be deceived at times is certainly not the same as saying that they're therefore useless. They're mainly extraordinarily helpful and accurate. One of the things that I found was that uh, I, and I, this was new territory to me, but to work out how much of what we see, and there are different aspects of visual perception, is given to us by the right hemisphere and by the left. And then to move on to being able to hear and discriminate uh, notes of music and and so on through the various... Uh, senses and what what I effectively found there can be stated very simply that the right hemisphere has the the better uh, capacity to make fine discriminations and to see perceive uh, the world accurately. Um, what what intrigues me is when those things go wrong, of course. But um, maybe we'll come on to that a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and as you say in the book, in in an era where there weren't very many brain scanners, the third century BC, <laughs> Greek, <laughs> Greek physicians had already been onto the fact that the right hemisphere was more perceptive. 
Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, That's right. So it's been, it's been known for a long time that the right hemisphere is better at perception. Yeah. I thought it was interesting in the light of the popular notion of thinking fast and slow, for example, that you say, if you want an accurate assessment rather than a quick one, the right hemisphere is to be preferred. In fact, there's evidence that the left hemisphere gets less reliable as you give it more time to respond. And I thought this was fascinating. You talk about, for example, in sports, in golfing, in uh, TT. I mean, that's a separate issue, though, um, w whether or not one's intuitions are impaired by having time to reflect. And generally speaking, they they are, though not invariably. Um, but yes, um, people often say to me, so I guess in terms of Dan Kahneman's type one and type two thinking, the left hemisphere will be the type two thinking, the more deliberative, and the right hemisphere, the sort of quick and dirty. But it turns out that the left hemisphere is the specialist in being quick and dirty, and as a result is quite often wrong, whereas it's the right hemisphere that is what uh, Ramachandran calls the devil's advocate, the one that's going, hang on, hang on. It may not be that. It might. It looks like that now to you, but it might be something else. Um, and is. It, 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 one of the reasons that the left hemisphere was thought for a long time to be somehow superior to the right was that it um, processed things by fractions of a second faster. But one of the things that's going on in those fractions of the seconds that takes the right hemisphere that little bit longer is that it's doing a more thorough and careful job. Um, and when something can be done, quickly and the right hemisphere needs to do it quickly it can do it as quickly as the left hemisphere back to to uh, perception you mentioned there for example even my pin doesn't do it justice for per perception and you tell us about some of the fascinating things were available to us to perceive for example you say and you mentioned this in part one because i was saying about how animals can perceive many different colors you say we're capable of discerning so many f up to 40 million different color stimuli and i thought that was absolutely fascinating and then you go on to say the greater part of our perception of the world comes by sight and other senses such as the human ear can discriminate 340,000 tones and then you talk about tastes and that we're capable of trillions of tastes as well and i was telling i was telling you i was on holiday when I was reading about this and I was telling this to my kids you know they're only they're only nine and 12 and they're like kind of going oh yeah that's really interesting dad and then jumping in the pool <laughs> I was like that's fascinating you should know this <laughs> yes yes I mean of course in sense of taste there are five main things that are contributed by your tongue salt sweet sour and bitter and uh, since I was in medical school they've added umami which is the taste of miso and so on. So those five flavors are offered by the tongue, but an almost infinitely greater um, range of taste is offered by the nose. So it's the coming together of the olfactory sense with what the tongue, the simple things the tongue can tell. But the, the, the um, human nose can distinguish trillions of scents seem to me absolutely amazing. Um, it, it made me feel rather ashamed because I'm not sure I can <laughs> distinguish trillions of scents. Certainly not now. I've had COVID recently and I can distinguish about two and a half, but I'm going to try and get back as close to trillions as I can <laughs> as soon as possible. Oh, you did You did have COVID at that time we were speaking. Mm. Oh, right. Okay. Well, glad you're yes, over. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's right. Um, but it, it did have the effect initially of completely wiping out my sense of smell altogether. But I can I can now smell faintly rather sort of strong things like the smell of ground coffee or of mothballs or. <laughs> You're not like up that. to trillions yet. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not anywhere near the trillions yet. <laughs> so but I hope it, to get back there because one of my great pleasures is tasting wine. Oh no, right. You know, for that you really need a good, a good nose. Yeah. Well, actually, speaking of that, you talk about actually the and and you know this can help us towards the idea of the intuitive sense and perception, the the wine tasting experts versus a beginner 
and the different parts of the brain that are are drawn upon that i found that absolutely fascinating i think that the finding there that you're referring to is that um, broadly speaking all of this stuff is done pretty much entirely by the right hemisphere but that the the the, the fine finer tuning stuff but in the case of wine experts there seem to be certain aspects that are more served by the left hemisphere and one of the ways that has been accounted for is because a lot of what um, a wine expert is doing, rather than just enjoying the wine, is categorizing and saying, ah, yes, and I can put a name and a label to that. And that that is very much the left hemisphere's way of doing it. So probably it's a, a synthesis of what the right and left do, with the left dominating at certain stages. It's a beautiful segue for Frank and the idea of listening to your gut and not having too much time, not doubting yourself, etc. And to introduce Frank, since he was a, a French gentleman, yeah. I found a beautiful quote in uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote, all the evil I ever did in my life was the result of reflection and the little good I have been able to do was the result of impulse. And I thought that was a great introduction for Frank. Oh, gosh, that's wonderful. And I didn't know that. Um, well, it does sort of ring a bell. But um, more recently, um, some research which I quote when I'm talking about morality uh, shows that, and this was done by rather cynically minded um, investigators, uh, looking at how much effort it took the human brain to lie and how much effort it took for the human brain to be honest. And they expected that actually lying was a fairly effortless process, but that sort of resisting this natural tendency as they saw it um, would be a more effortful business. And they found the exact opposite, that when people... When people respond normally, they respond naturally and with generosity. And that is not costly, as it were, in terms of mental energy. But when they need to lie, this costs them more energy and is a much more unusual thing to do. Now, we're talking here about the broad mass of humanity, not the 1% to 2% uh, that are psychopaths who sometimes... Uh, just lie for the hell of it. I mean, they, they, they become so used to lying that they get a sort of kick out of lying and seeing that people believe their lie. So uh, them apart, the, the ordinary person does not have to correct a selfish, um, self-furthering um, way of being. Instead, if they want to be like that, they have to step back from their natural tendency to be generous in spirit, which I thought was a, a good um, thing to find. They also found that people who are more cynical were less intelligent, which is quite interesting. Because there's a, there is a kind of perception in society that, you know, that there's some connection between being very clever and being very cynical. But actually what they found was that very clever people were able to be more trusting, partly because um, they had enough cognitive capacity to be able to distinguish things, whereas it's a safer bet if you haven't got much cognitive capacity and you don't really know very much about people, it's just to be generally um, sceptical as a way of sort of protecting yourself from being taken in. I thought that was interesting as well. So, so many of the myths we're told about ourselves, about how squalid and selfish and incapable of good we are, are fabulously wrong. Um, but I suppose the point about Franck um, is a lovely one, but it's not got much to do with morality. <laughs> but, but it certainly has to do with um, behaving effectively. So I'll just very briefly introduce Franck. Um, I think it was first his wife and then he who wrote to me after reading The Master and His Emissary. And the story is that Franck, uh, originally a Frenchman, I think he uh, was a young man in Canada. He developed... A, a program uh, looking at 120 or so different aspects of a racehorse that could weight these in such a way that he thought he could assess which one of them was going to be a very fine winner. So this was an entirely procedural, algorithmic way of doing things. And 
for some reason, um, latish in life, he decided he would retire to England and lives in the south of England, and there are a number of famous race courses there. And he decided he would make a living as a tipster at the races. <clears throat> and what he found was that, don't forget, he's had a lifetime's experience of looking at horses. He he would get, um, for 20, 30 seconds before a race, a view of a horse often being led by its um, jockey around a paddock, or just riding for a few steps fairly slowly around the paddock. And on that basis, and that basis alone, he was expected or expected himself to be able to make a guess as to which horse was going to win. And as he pointed out to me, sometimes a win is a very close thing, like a tenth of a second. And he found to his amazement that he often made very good um, choices. And then after a while, doubt set in, and he thought to himself, but I can't, how can I really make it? I can't do, I can't really make an assessment of something so fine by just looking at this horse for this period of time. It's not rational. And so he would start saying, he would give outside odds on, on a certain horse, and then he'd go, but how can I know that? Make it uh, two to one or something. And then the horse would win, and the the um, bookmakers would say, why didn't you just stick to your original instinct? And they found time and again that he would send his original thing and then he would revise it seconds later. And eventually they said to him, don't think about it. Just put down the text and send it. Now, as long as he did that, he was able from his bets to... Um, derive a six-figure annual salary, but that if he thought about them in any way, pondered on them afterwards, he did no better than chance, so he didn't make any money. And there were a couple of other things he noticed. One was that his son is very interested in horses, knows a lot about them, wanted to come with him to the races. And he said that just having him there, not necessarily explaining things to him, but just having him there meant that his... Um, his ability to, to pick the winner went straight down to zero. And so again, they said, would you mind not taking your son with you? He also noticed that if he had a, he mustn't try too hard. He mustn't have read anything about the horses that would give him preconceptions. Um, he must have had a good night's sleep, or if not, to have a, a snooze for about 20 to 40 minutes in the car um, on the way to the event. But as long as these things were observed, he found that he had an extraordinary insight into how this horse was going to win. And I asked him, how, what was it that he thought that he looked at? And he said, well, I don't really know, but if I had to say, it's something like, does this horse feel comfortable with this rider? Does this rider seem able to pick up something from the horse? I mean, it was, it was very nebulous stuff that, again, it would be very hard to detect. But the reality is that he does. And um, afterwards, I, I've met him and his wife, and they both thanked me, um, nothing to do with me, but, you know, for the effect that just telling him it's okay and it makes sense that they that had had on him. He now trusted himself and was able to, to carry on. That This part, in I, I wrote to you when I was uh, on holidays and I just went how... Um, I also felt that reading about Frank, uh, you know, I didn't say this to you, but I, I played professional rugby at a, for some of the best teams in Europe. And what, this is the kind of pattern I can see in, in retrospect is I'd make it into the team playing from the right hemisphere, <laughs> playing just for the, the joie, joie de jouer, and um, just to play and enjoy it, etc. And then when I made it and I'd created this kind of success element, I, I then tried to protect that. And once I tried to protect it, the left kind of takes over and I tumbled uh, and I didn't play as well. And then it was like mm -hmm. kind of going, oh, well, play like you were playing. And then you're kind of going, I'm, I'm trying. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. the point, you know, and, and then oftentimes people yeah. in sport go, you're trying too hard. You're thinking about yes. it too much. Yes. Yeah, and I found yeah. uh, reading this, I was like, ah, and then yeah, the other yeah, thing yeah. is that this happens to change makers. And I'm speaking to our audience here in organizations. They're often 
victims of gaslighting because mm. they have an intuitive sense of a threat and an, or an opportunity in the organization. Mm. And then the organization, mm. like the tipsters, try to get the change maker to explain it. And it's coming from mm. somewhere different and they can't articulate it. Mm. And there's a great mm. quote mm. by Dr. Joe Dispenza. He said, thoughts are the language of the mind and feelings are the language of the body. And they're not the same. They don't come from the same place. Mm. And this whole mm. section just spoke so much mm. to me. I'd love you to maybe pull out yes. parts, please. Yes. Well, one immediate one to pull out from there is that what you describe is an example of what happens when the left hemisphere reflects on what has just happened and tries to understand it in its own terms. It can't understand bodily intuitions. So what it thinks is that you did this, you logically thought about that, and then you mix that with another thing that you knew. And hey, presto, on this formula, you came up with an answer. And the left hemisphere's attempt to reconstruct after the fact what happened is completely unreliable. And its idea is that you walk into a familiar room and you spot spot a couple of prominent things and you 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 say oh yes that's my my sofa there's the there's the television or whatever I know it's my living room but it doesn't work like that at all uh, long before you've been able to detect any individual things you're aware of the, what the room is and then your attention is attracted to the sofa the television or whatever it is um, but the left hemisphere is always looking at an intermediate process that comes later it doesn't understand the first aspect of intuition and there's so much to say about that. In sports, they talk about choking, which is when people are trying too hard and are therefore in that conscious realm. Um, uh, I, I, I guess there's stuff from so many different areas. One is from uh, art connoisseurs being able to uh, validate or spot as a fraud um, a work of art and they often can't say immediately what it is uh, you know the computer wants to know so what detail was it but actually it's often something that is an overall sense that just doesn't seem right for that painter and then they can also home in on certain details a fingernail or something and they just think that, that just doesn't seem right but more often than not it's a gut feeling they have and literally I mean one art critic in looking at the Getty Kouros, which is a famous case of a, a, um, an ancient Greek statue of a, a young male, that's what a Kouros means, um, and it was acquired by the Getty for a large sum of money, and uh, it's now largely been shown that I think most people know that it is a fake, but it was enough to take in certain people initially, but then a handful of experts who were brought in um, describes feeling sick on seeing it. It was something that made them intuitively in their gut know that this was something not true, um, which always is 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 interesting. I perhaps ought to mention another uh, person who who came to me after reading the Master and His Emissary. Um, and this is a, a doctor on the Isle of Man who looked after the, uh, the, the well-being of the riders on the Manx TT races. These are races been going now for a hundred years. And uh, they, the race uh, goes on for two weeks because they, the, the, there's not room for them all to ride together. So they, they ride um, each against their own time. A 62-mile course, I think, that goes over mountaintops, has sharp bends in it, and is on ordinary roads with potholes, drain covers, <laughs> um, and all the normal stuff that goes with just riding on an ordinary road. So, in some ways, a very dangerous sport, and people do fairly often die on it. And amazingly, on this course, um, riders reach speeds of up to 200 miles an hour. So obviously it's something that is extremely skillful, but the skill cannot be computed. It's not something which is worked out on the basis of a few perceived facts and generated as a secondary consequence. The riders are able to feel 
something which enables them to make judgments. So, for example, there's a grandstand quite high up on one part of the island, which is a favourite place for people to go and watch the contestants come by. And after the grandstand, it goes steeply down a hill with a sharp turn to the right at the bottom, and then on to a bridge at a place called Quarter Bridge, which is something like a mile, mile and a half on from the grandstand. And he said to um, one of the riders, the positioning as you pass the grandstand is so crucial because you've got to go down this hill and take that bend. If you were like an inch wrong, you wouldn't be able to do it. How do you get that right? And he said, when I'm at the grandstand, I'm at quarter bridge. I'm not there. I'm somewhere else already, further down the track. He didn't know what he thought thought then because he was already further on on this journey. And in this, in the description of the riders, one of the things that he notices is this very strange, open, almost mesmeric look in the eyes. They're not focused on the here and now, but they're somehow focused elsewhere. But they also have enormous peripheral vision as well they can see tiny things on the edges of their vision so clearly not a left hemisphere targeted vision but a kind of intensely open vision uh, and they describe for example one describes even within his helmet being able to smell the tobacco of a cigarette being lit up in a field by a person who's quite a long way from the track and you know there are a whole lot of things that, that that ring a bell for me. One is that there's a couple of occasions on which people have produced record results after failing. In other words, they something happened on on the journey. They missed something that they shouldn't. They had to slow down and mend something or fiddle with it. And they just thought, oh well, I can't win now. And they just did their best on the way back and didn't push it, and to their amazement discovered that they'd made a record, which is also very good. One of the things you have to, one of the many things you have to watch is that the, the bike is being driven at such high speeds for a long period that one of the problems is the engine seizing up. And so there is a, um, a thermometer that gives you readings and every rider knows there is a critical you know, place to remain below and not to get into that danger zone. And in order to make it more accurate, uh, on more modern models, they replaced an analog dial with um, a digital one. And the digital one was hopeless. Uh, people couldn't work with it. They had to drive slower because the analog thing they could take in in a thousandth of a second, but the the digital one took them half a second to assess, and it, it wasn't it wasn't any use. Which actually speaks again to the mechanistic world, you know that that we're entering yes. into. But but something you mentioned there about the the racer giving up the ghost on the race essentially and just relaxing and going you know what I, i'll do this for the enjoyment of it it, yes. it also relates to the workplace because um you mentioned how intuitives when they're put in situations of high reward don't perform as well as intellectuals yes no that was the interesting thing the effect of high reward uh, seem to make them work less well. I think what it is, is it brings the immediate idea again that there's a lot at stake here. And so I must do, you know, uh, strive for that. Whereas if the pressure is taken off, I don't think it's an argument for not rewarding your <laughs> intuitives, but not making a present connection between what they're doing now and the money they may make. That was really the point. One of the most... Um commented on aspects of, of our first conversation was when you were talking about the creativity that if you ordain creativity from the boardroom, and you give people a distinctive uh, timeline, they're going to absolutely bomb it. And and that links very strongly to this part of about the metrics I find because, again, this is a huge problem in, in corporate change and innovation and transformation is you're, you're, you know, put a team together, like you said, tell them to innovate and then give them a timeline and then tell them when is this going to be profitable you're damn sure it's going to absolutely fail
Mm. No, that's right. And it's partly the process of micromanaging and seeing things in the short term all the time, whereas the right hemisphere is willing to take hands off and allow things to go over much longer time periods. But the more we're obsessed by maximizing utility, which is the only goal of the left hemisphere, um, we become frightened of letting go. We must be managing this to make sure that nothing is wasted. The trouble is that if you do that, everything is wasted, because at the end of the day, none of your creative stuff will actually have happened. Instead, um, you will have stopped the true creators from performing by not giving them enough freedom. Um, and the other people who are not really creative will have turned up with something which is third best, if that. And it's it, again, it links back to what you were saying about the left wanting to break it down to distinctive steps, while the right is like, can see the, see the vision, I can see the end product, I can see how it's going to work out, but I don't ask me to give you a roadmap, I can't, I can't actually deliver that. Yes, two things um, that have been well established in uh, um, psychological studies. One is of um, higher intelligent mathematical solvers and less intelligent mathematical solvers. Less intelligent mathematical solvers follow steps and can say at a certain point, well, I'm getting warmer, I'm getting warmer, meaning they're getting closer. Uh, and when they don't get it right, which they often don't, they have a result that they feel confident about. Now, the highly um, gifted mathematicians don't have any such steps, and they can't report any improvement until perhaps um, as late on as even less than eight seconds before the solution has come. They say, I feel there's something there. Um, so it's much less of a graded process. It's much less of a deliberate process. And it, it is leaving things in that fertile, unknowing state as long as you possibly can before crystallizing out the answer. But everything about the way management thinks is to get the answers early, to get things crystallized early. But the more you put pressure on the early stages of a, fa of a process, you will reduce it to the, the little that can be seen at that stage. So you need to take all these pressures off. And people will say, yes, but then if I don't manage it and I don't keep measuring it, um, you know, some people will will not produce that they, they, they'll you know whether they're just taking the mickey or they just haven't got round to doing it you know and so i'll lose that and and i say to them yes you might lose 20 percent, but if you don't do that you'll lose 100 percent because everyone will come up with non-original stuff that's no use to you <laughs> there is no such thing as no risk in life <laughs> and leave the organization because they're fed up with it and they'll, they'll look for somewhere else you know but unfortunately there's not that many places to go <laughs> often they become self-employed i've noticed that increasingly um people with the really big new ideas are on not in the big organizations not in the big universities even they are all the big corporations they're often working alone or in small groups on the fringes and that's where the really you know the mind-bending stuff comes <laughs> exploration exploitation and uh that's I, it I, that's it i love i loved where, where one of the things you talked about was uh, moments of incubated intuition and i'm sure you had yes. many of them walking around talisker for this book even <laughs> writing this book moments where like ah i have it uh, i thought this was a lovely term to share with our audience yes in the terms of incubation, yes, I mean, it's not, I think, original to me, but I, I suggest that there are phases in which different behaviours and indeed different hemisphere inputs are involved. So the, to begin with, the, what one has to do is rather like um, wanting a plant to grow. You can't make a plant grow. No gardener can make a plant grow. The plant will grow of its own but what you can do is make the right conditions there for it to grow in or not and so the first thing is laying the ground and this means you know um, doing some research uh, doing some sort of explicit thinking and deciding that this is a good place to leave it for the moment and then allowing a fallow period in which the left hemisphere will retire and the right hemisphere will come into play of allowing various images and so on to work 
And this is the incubating period, which is sometimes actually associated with sleep, but often with turning the attention away from the problem without perhaps entirely neglecting it, but occasionally coming back to think of it, but not pushing it, but just allowing it to be in a kind of discourse with all the other things that you're currently working on, not in the foreground. And then there comes the moment of illumination when something comes out of this is the flower, you know, that... Uh, uh, and that's what they call the aha moment in psychology, um, fairly obviously. <laughs> and that is associated very strongly with the right superior temporal sulcus and the right amygdala. And that is where big solutions come from, not just in art, although they obviously do, not just in music, though they obviously do, but in science, in maths, in technology. In all these areas, these aha moments are driven by the, the right hemisphere's ability to see shapes, to see forms, to see reconfigurations, and to feel that shape, I recognize that. Where do I recognize that confirmation from? It's like something else. And so you're, you're moving by analogy, not by analysis. And that, that's the problem, is that our world is so dominated by this idea that if you can just analyze it, you will understand it. That actually, at a certain stage, there is nothing wrong with analysis. I do a lot of it myself, but I always remember to return. That's just a staging post. It won't give you any answers in itself. To return with what I've learned from that to a place where it can be put together anew into something richer that can stand forward. We had on the show George Lakoff talking about metaphors we live by, and he's already also wrote a book, uh, written a book on mathematics, actually. Um, and to the surprise, and you mentioned this in the book, is that he he mentions mathematics as thinking in pictures. You know that that if you can do that for a child, the child actually will perform much better. But I I thought I say that to say metaphors is so important. As a person who thinks in metaphor, I I kind of spot these patterns and kind of go oh that's just like that and it helps me retain the information and I thought we'd share the importance of metaphor as well because it's so important for intuition and imagination yes yes um, if we didn't talk about this before um, I do think it's terrifically important it's the ground of how we think at all and interestingly particularly in maths and science <laughs> because the, the, all that strange abstract language that is used by maths and science is based on very concrete images that come from real real life so um you know i, I say even the word abstraction comes from a root meaning drawing something away from its natural home <laughs> abstracting it um and even words like immaterial um, comes from a root materia, which means material, it means wood, and originally its root is mater, the mother, and it's the, the sense of the fertile material world out of which the living, like wood, comes, and that is stuff we call material, and then the immaterial world is something that is piggybacking on that, and is contrasting with that. So even the words we use to describe the most abstract and immaterial aspects of things actually have their roots in in the everyday business of our body's engagement with the world. Ian, we're we're running out of time. You have a keynote to uh, to give now in a few moments, and uh, two two things I thought we'd finish on. One was the extreme importance to know the difference between imagination and fantasy. And then intuition and imagination and how they're linked as well. And you, again, we're not giving it justice here the way you do in the book and you go deep into both of these, but I'd love to share these with our audience. Well, okay. Yes, well, I mean, intuition can cover just uh, such a lot of things, things that we call instincts, um, knee-jerk reactions, um, rules of thumb, uh, insights into problem-solving, um, having a sense of things, having even uh, a, a, any kind of a, 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 a um, 
a sense of, of what you're dealing with ahead of the time. So all these things are parts of intuition. I deal with them separately in, in a, a couple of chapters. And then in the third chapter, I, I bridge from intuition to imagination because in a way, what happens in intuition is that we are using our imagination to see something that it connects. Um, and it isn't really a hard and fast rule about what we mean by imagination, surprisingly. Um, but what I am keen to differentiate it from, because I think it's so very important a faculty to have, the imagination, is to di differentiate it from fantasy. So fantasy is something that we dress up reality in, in order to make it different so we don't see it as it is. Imagination is, by contrast, the faculty that gives us our only chance of actually seeing our way into what something really is. And this distinction was one made by two very important figures in the history of English literature, Wordsworth and Coleridge. And they were reacting against the earlier prettifying pastoral type poetry in which lords and ladies dressed up as shepherds and shepherdesses and so forth. And this is in a way fantasy, but it's not really using the imagination. Um, it doesn't really tell you much about the nature of being a shepherd or shepherdess. Whereas imagination is what is brought to bear on, in Wordsworth's case, often a part of the landscape that you might never have noticed. It might even be just a bleak outcrop of rock, but that that outcrop is more than it seems. And he begins to feel the sense of it as a living thing. And he sees the landscape as living and responsive. And this process of imagination is a coming together, an encounter of two living entities in which each reveals more of itself in the process of approximating it to the other. Now that's quite different from the business of fantasy in which you um, look at the rock and imagine it's a space station that's on the you know, on its way to, to somewhere else. I mean, that's, that's taking you out of this situation, whereas imagination is allowing you to see for the first time the full depth of what is there. In Merton College, Oxford, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, was professor of, uh, of, of English, or of a certain aspect of English, and uh, he used to come and dine in, in the college in the evening, and other fellows would bring their guests, and of course the guests would always want to be introduced to Tolkien. So um, the other fellows got mighty tired of this thing where the, p the person came in and said, oh, Professor Tolkien, your works are so wonderful, so so full of imagination. And he'd say, well, that's very kind and so on. And anyway, one day, uh, a, a, um, a, a guest of one of the fellows came in and went up to Tolkien and started gushing rapturously. Professor Tolkien, your works are so marvellous. They're quite unequaled for their imagination. And from behind a newspaper, a grumpy Macedon was heard to say, Imagination? Imagination? Made it all up. <laughs> I, I did that did uh it did ring true for me with again you know when you have that corporate innovator coming along yeah. and saying uh, look this is happening in the, the business environment's changing and all of a sudden they get that type of reaction it happens a lot um is so that it, is that so oh so it's uh, it's awful. I like this. I like like the story you just told me. I didn't know it about Mozart. Do you want to tell it? Please, you tell us. Please, you tell it. And your, your, oh, your voice oh, okay. is better than mine, man. <laughs> oh no! Come on. <laughs> so Aidan wrote, told me an anecdote which I should know because I'm very fond of Mozart about him being approached when he was um, a young man by another young man who asked him to teach him how to compose, and Mozart said but you're too young to compose. And the man said, but I'm 21, and you were composing works when you were only 10. And Mozart said, yes, but I didn't go around asking people how it was done. <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I heard about that from Charlie Munger, you know, the Warren Buffett's uh, kind of right-hand man. He, he was saying that when oh. he, was asked, he was asked about how do, you, how do you do this, how do you do this, and that was his answer, which is uh, yeah. It's a very good one. Yeah.
Yeah, but I mean, it, really, it, it, it's the best way of saying, you know, that how we do much of this stuff is is not the way our conscious mind thinks it's to be done. And if you have to ask, you don't know. That's the thing. And, it, and it, like, you know, we read about so much about, you know, it, it should be simple, but not simpler. <laughs> Einstein and stuff yeah, like that's that. That's right. Einstein, yeah. Ian, we're 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 out of time, I think, man. Um, okay. Is there anything, is there anything yep. you, you? I I thought rather than I I usually pull a final quote, etc. Um, I by the way, some of the comments on YouTube is like I could listen to this man speak forever, uh, talking of of your <laughs> your voice, and I want oh, to save that oh, voice. It's right. your it's your tool of your trade. So, um, uh, you you there was a reason you wrote this book, and. You, you mm -hmm. kind of started off w with part one telling us about that and thank you for giving us three parts it's a it's a gift and i'm very grateful for it but if you had one message for everybody listening and that message was coming from the heart from, from the right hemisphere what would that be oh be more humble be more compassionate be capable of feeling the wonder that's just there and being alive. Beautiful. Yeah. Ian, before I close up, I, I just again want to express my gratitude, but where can people find well, you? Because you produce so much content. There's uh, obvious by this mm. book, but also lots of video content that you're gracious to share, but also there's a members club. Yeah. There is. Um, there's a place called uh, Channel McGilchrist, and uh, most of what's on it you can quite honestly access for free. If you want one or two other facilities, um, then you can become a channel member. Uh, uh, and don't ask me to say exactly what it is that you get when you're a channel member, but one of them is you get to be able to ask questions of me and uh, every six weeks or a couple of months I hold a session in which I answer those questions and it's a live session and people can put other questions. Um, and I don't think you have to join up to get a newsletter, which my PA Mary Atwood puts out every week. Um, and, there's a, and there's also within that, I think, a, a calendar of events. And you can find my stuff all over the internet. In fact, one of my friends said in a rather grumpy way, I can't go online anywhere now without finding you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's so, just him being like Tolkien. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, it's, it's always okay. a pleasure. Always such a pleasure. Uh, Author uh, of The Matter of Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions, and The Unmaking of the World. Dr. Ian McGilchrist, it's been an absolute honor. Oh, well, thank you so much, Aidan, you very dear man. <laughs> thank you. What an incredible series. I got so much out of it. I hope you did too. We have much more coming down the line in the Brains, Beliefs and Biases series. Before we finish today's show, I just want to thank our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. See you very soon.